Good evening, everyone, and welcome. I'm so excited to have all of you join us tonight. I am Lorna Schumann, the Curator of edu Education here at the Illinois State Museum, and I want to thank you for joining us for tonight's program on Indigenous storytelling with storyteller Joyce Miller Bean. I would like to introduce our speaker tonight, our storyteller Joyce Miller Bean. She is a retired DePaul University instructor of English and literature, and she is an active presence in academia. However, most recently, she has been the facilitator of a series of workshops for Native American writers through the University of Illinois at Chicago and at Northwestern University. She is an African American and Native American of the Muscogee Creek Tribal Nation and has been a professional storyteller for over 30 years. Twice, she has been the official storyteller for the Illinois State Library at the Illinois State Fair, as well as having been one of the storytellers in a PBS television series called Story Barn. She has done multicultural storytelling for multiple branches of the Chicago Public Library, as well as stories at the Chicago Public Schools, private schools, and varied houses of worship, and private parties and gathering. Her storytelling repertoire includes classic tales from Aesop's to Shakespeare and many types of ethnic folk tales and more. And she tells stories for adults as well as children. Without much to do, I would like to introduce Joyce Miller Bean to everyone and turn the program over to Joyce. Joyce? Hello, I am delighted to be here. I welcome you all and I'm very honored as well as pleased to be your storyteller tonight. As Lorna pointed out, I'm Afro-Indigenous and that background has a lot of, has given me a lot of awareness of the value and the importance of storytelling to every type of ethnic group, cultural enclave, you name it. But with Native American people, this is particularly vital as so much of the history and legacy of so many of our people has come through storytelling. If you look at petroglyphs, the signs that are the images that are that are on rocks from long ago, many of which go back are dated back as far as 8,000 years, and many of which appear particularly in southwestern uh, reservations. These are not cuneiform or hieroglyphs as we have in the um, Egyptian cultures. No, no, these are stories. They talk about moral and and ethical beliefs of things of this sort, sort, wisdom that needs to be passed on. And that is to me why the importance of and joy of storytelling continues. Now, what was, what is the purpose for Native American storytelling or any for that matter? It can be divided into a lot of categories. Uh, teaching, carrying, of course, historical input from, from former generations to be shared with present and future, but also, it, can, it includes entertainment, fun, teaching cultural values. You name it, there's an awful lot about the human condition that is included in storytelling. And Native American storytelling traditions are included in family and, and, and onward in many, many ways. Lorna made reference to my having done a television series called Story Barn. And at that series, when we were taping it, um, there were, well, I'd say 20, 25 storytellers who had been invi invited from all across the country to New York. We were sent, uh, invited to New York to um, film this series. But the two best story storytellers, they waited until the end for them. One of whom was a, an Irish gentleman and the other of whom was a Native American gentleman. I am sorry to say I do not remember his name, but I bring this up because that was my first introduction all those years ago to an in-person um, viewing of the power of storytelling, particularly for indigenous people in this way. Um, the Irish gentleman was fantastic. He had, an, and he was very animated and outgoing and he had a few props, it was wonderful. Then the Native American gentleman came on. He was a slender man, a um, bit older. His face was slightly lined and very nice looking gentleman. Um, so was the Irish gentleman. Um, and he sat 
on a stool. That was his only prop. And his voice never rose above the level I'm using right now. And I remember at first thinking after this very lively presentation, I thought, oh my, how is this gentleman going to capture our interest? Well, let me tell you, within 10 minutes, I was mesmerized. And so was everyone else in the room. As he quietly told a story of, a, of his grandmother and a, and a feather that she controlled in an enchanted way and how it affected them all. He was brilliant and never raised his voice, nev never had additional props, but the power of his storytelling is what came through. And that strength, that power, that historicality, that is the, at the heart of storytelling in the, in the Native American community and in and, and many, many others. Which leads me towards our first story. Um, I have four stories for you tonight. And I would like to invite you as we take a, about a 10 minute pause, no, not pause, that is in leaving, <laughs> um, between each of the stories, I'm going to ask for your input and ideas about certain elements. And I hope you will feel free to um, add those to the chat. And, I, and of course, any questions you may have for me, please feel free. Um, so the first tale I have is The Meeting of the Wild Animals. And this comes from the uh, Shimshen tribal nation in, um, they're near British Columbia. Um, and let me begin. So the Shimshen people were great, great hunters, marvelous hunters. In fact, they were so good that all of the animals in their area became terrified. These hunters would follow them into their dens. They would catch, capture them in ways that these animals had never encountered. And as a result, one day, the grizzly bear, who was more or less the unelected leader of the large animals, called a gathering of all of the large animals to discuss this problem. Now, this would include the black bear, the, the panther, the wolf, the wolverine, all of the large animals. And they met in the grizzly bear's den. And he said to them after they had all settled into their various corners, all right, what we face with these Shemshen hunters is something we have never faced before. I have never had them come into my den. Have any of you? No, 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 no. All agreed that this was an unusual and frightening situation. Well, I have an idea, said the grizzly bear. I believe that we should ask he who created all things to extend and make much colder the winter. Don't you see? If the hunters cannot come out because it is so very cold and that we stay snug and warm within our various dens, this will solve the problem. They will have to seek their, their skins and their food in other sources and we will be safe. What do you think, my friends? Well, the larger animals nodded and looked upon each other and sounds good. And the wolf rose up from his corner and said, grizzly bear, I would agree. I think we all would agree. This is a very, very excellent idea. I do think, however, we should include the smaller animals, um, the porcupine, the raccoon, uh, the mink, uh, the beaver and even the very small animals, the mice, the insects, because if we all come together, we can certainly defeat these hunters. What say you all? And all of the animals, including the grizzly bear, agreed. So the next day, the grizzly bear sent out word to all of the animals, the smaller ones, the very tiny ones, all of them, to meet at a place he had designated, much larger than his den. And at the appointed time, they all appeared huge masses of them. The large animals staying on the left side in a, in a kind of a semicircle, the smaller animals on the right, and the very tiny animals down at the end, all eagerly moving, waiting, and settling in. After there was a quiet had descended, the, the grizzly bear slumped forward to the center, rose up on his great hind legs, and looked around before beginning to speak. My fellow creatures, he said, we have come together because we face a mutual problem, a mutual enemy, these hunters. Now, 
we, the larger animals, have decided that it would be a good idea to ask he who created all things to expand the winter. Because don't you see, when the hunters cannot get out in the bitter cold, they will be forced to stay in their homes and we will be safe in our dens. What think you? There was silence among the smaller animals, a rather restlessness, shoulders moving and, and, and looking at each other awkwardly. The larger animals, particularly the grizzly bear who had felt himself the unappointed leader for years. Well, well, what think you of this idea? At that point, the porcupine rose up. Shambling towards the center, he <clears throat> cleared his throat and he said, ah, my fellow creatures, while we appreciate the danger and gravity of these hunters, I do not think asking for an extended winter would be the correct solution. The grizzly bear's eyes began to blaze and he stared at the smaller creature with his back filled with quills and said, why not? The porcupine, remaining quite calm, looked at him and said, because you larger creatures have fur. You have, have larger bodies that are filled with, with the kind of fat that can keep you going for a long time in the winters. We smaller creatures do not have that. And the very small creatures, and here he turned towards the mice and the insects, the very small creatures, they, they have no such things at all. While you are in, being warm, we would die, we would freeze. We could not have access to our food. What would we do? No, no, there must be another way to handle this situation. There must be. And the porcupine turned around and rejoined his fellows. The grizzly bear took a deep breath and looked with a look that had nothing in it for good about the porcupine. Then he threw back his head and bellowed, paying no attention to this creature. What knows the porcupine of good ideas? We will follow through on what I have suggested because that is the best solution. And those who do not wish to join us, they will find themselves in a more difficult situation than they can imagine. All the animals seemed stunned. The smaller animals shrunk back, except the porcupine. His eyes began to blaze too. And this time when he moved towards the center of the council circle, he did not in any way shamble in friendly and gently. Instead, he began to shake and then he said, no. And he stuck his thumb in his mouth, <laughs> bit it off and spat it out. <gasps> All the animals gasped as the porcupine then took his other hand, shoved that thumb in his mouth <laughs> and spat it out. And then he held up his four fingers on each hand and said, you see, you see how seriously you must take me? I am fearless and I will not be treated in this way. The other animals, including the bear, sat back. They had never seen such boldness. And if you look to this day, porcupines have only four fingers on each hand as a result of this. The porcupine stared steadily at the grizzly bear and the grizzly bear swallowed, said, fine, fine. Um, perhaps, perhaps this is something to consider. The panther among the large animals stood up, looked at the grizzly bear, looked at the porcupine and said, yes, I would agree the porcupine is right. We cannot expect all of the animals to be able to handle this the way we can. And then the porcupine nodded and said, and let me point something else out, bear. If you were to do this, you yourselves, when the warmer weather usually comes, would find none of the berries and roots that you eat until the other animals emerge and the other ways of you getting food become known. So you yourselves with this requested extended and bitterly cold winter would be hurting yourselves. At that, the bear and the other large animals all nodded and said, well, well what, what, what would you suggest, porcupine, said the bear, stuttering and relinquishing all elements that appeared that he was in charge. The porcupine thought for a moment, and then he said this, I say, we ask he who makes all things to make half of the year a normal winter cold, the other half a warmer, more comfortable time. 
That way there will be a balance between when the creatures can come out and eat and, and be, remain and grow and have their families. And in the colder months, all of us can go into our dens. Some may sleep, some may stay inside in other ways, but there will be a balance. And looking around to all the animals, he said, what say you all? And every creature there, from the tiniest insect to the, the, the great bears, all said yes, nodded in agreement. And so it was decided, and so it was done. And he who makes all things agreed to this, and which is why we have the winter and the autumn when it is colder, and the spring and the summer when it is warmer. And this is the way it has been and the way it follows through it is today. Oh, and one more thing. Two days after that great council meeting, the porcupine went to the den of every creature that had gone against him in that angry way, starting with the grizzly bear. And turning his back, he hurled huge amounts of his painful spines into them. And they, ah, ah, each of them writhed in pain as his punishment for having done this to him. His quills remained embedded in them and hurt them throughout the next days. And to, from that day to this, all of the creatures fear and respect the porcupine. Now, what I would like to ask when we, um, if you could think about it for a moment, and of course, if you have any regular, any questions for me beyond this, I'm happy to, to answer them before going on to the next story. But I ask you this, I've mentioned some of the reasons that storytelling is an art and a part of the, the lives of, of every culture on earth, as far as I can make out. So this story, do you think it was meant to be instructive, entertaining? Um, and if instructive, what is it meant to convey? What is it, what idea is it meant to instruct its viewers and its listeners in? And if it is entertainment, why would that be of value in this way? So, um, Leaving at that, I would like to, to take a moment to see, take a few moments, see if there are any questions or comments, give you a moment to think about it in relation to this. So I will just remain silent until I go to the next story. So anyone who wants can put their questions or comments in the chat, or they can put their questions also in the Q&A. Everyone seems very quiet. Charlie. Okay, <laughs> not a problem. It is not mandatory. I hope there will be some. I'm always curious and very eager to hear uh, other people's views about these. And please remember everyone, there is no, as we all tell our students, because I know the majority of you are educators, there is no right or wrong answer. This is just um, all of us discussing it. But let's go on to the next story. Um, and, this one is the rabbit huntress, and it's from the Zuni people of New Mexico. Now, many, many years ago, in what we would call the ancient times, there was a young woman who lived with her elderly parents. Sadly, they were the three of them alone because all of her older brothers and her uncles, her mother and father's brothers had been killed or had died, been killed in various wars, or died of sickness or accident. So it was just she and her elderly parents left to take care of the family and she to take care of them. Because they had no male relatives to act as hunters because in their nation, the men alone did the hunting. They were relegated to eating only what she, the young lady could grow in her garden, in the family's garden. Pumpkins, corn, squash, uh, these types of things, beans. And they led, they were able to eat and, and keep going, but they missed the having a, a meat, the raw, the, the warmth of, of furs that could become, that could be procured in this way. And so 
as the times went on and her parents became more and more frail, the young woman worried about this. One morning she was out on the terrace that was at the top of their house and she was watching all the young men of the village, the hunters, going out with their various with cords wrapped around them on which they would hang the, the bring back the rabbits that they would have captured for food and fur. And as she watched them going, she felt frustrated that she was not able to provide better food for her parents. She was a very kind and generous young woman and didn't really think about herself so much as she thought about her parents, her elderly parents. But she sighed and went about the day's tasks. That evening, near twilight, she went back to the to the top of her parents' home to watch the young men of the village of her village returning. And much to her, not surprise, but frustration, each one of them was laden down with cords on which were attached the bodies of the rabbits that they would use for meat and stew and whose skins would make blankets and, and outer clothing. And from first to last, not a single one of the young men of the village did not have some form of provision for his family. Now, you might be justifiably wondering, well, why didn't any of these people try to share with this young woman who was all alone with no male relatives to hunt and her elderly parents? Ah, the reason was that for this young woman, because she was so generous and worried about her parents, she refused to accept any of the marriage proposals that several of the young men in the village had made to her. And therefore, they became very haughty and disdainful of her and her needs. Very unkind attitude, but nonetheless, the one they held. So she was, in essence, the sole support of her family. Very unusual for her nation, for a woman to be in that role. But she thought about it during the night. She couldn't sleep. And she kept thinking, why shouldn't I be able to hunt rabbits? I know exactly where, they, where their lairs are, as I've seen others. I used to go out riding with my father just to keep him company. I can do what these young men do and provide my parents who need that. They need more than just corn and squash and beans. I can do this. And the next morning, after she had prepared breakfast, she sat her parents down and said, I have an idea, and explained to them how she intended from that afternoon on to go out and find, hunt them rabbits. Her parents were horrified. Her mother said, no, no, my daughter, you cannot do that, a young woman alone? A and it is dangerous out there? Oh no, 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 we will get by, we will, we will enjoy our vegetables. And her father agreed, he said, no, my child, it would be dark before you came home. There are wild creatures out there and you've never gone on a hunt. True, true, you know the land surrounding our home, but..." This is beyond that. But the young girl said, no, mother, father, I am determined. You need this and I will provide it. Well, once the young woman's parents saw that she was absolutely determined, they made this, they sighed, looked at each other and said, well then we will help. Her father immediately went to the rooms of her late brothers and gathered as many of their items as she might need, a strong stone ax, a, two cords like ropes that she could carry on her shoulders were she fortunate enough to capture any rabbits. He also began to adapt, particularly for her feet, the deer skins, moccasins and the deer skin uh, boots that her brothers had worn. So he, he began to brush and clean and turn them inside out so that the um, skin part would be outside and the warm fur would cover her feet and legs. And then he did the same, adapting one of her brother's jackets so that over her own clothing, she could be very warm. While her father was doing this, her mother was in the kitchen making corn cakes and pulling through them as she cooked them a, a strong rod so that they had a hole in the center of them. And after she had cooked them, laid them to, to cool in the ashes of the fireplace. And when they were cool, she threaded them on to a stick and tied the ends, which she put, gave to her daughter so that she would be able to carry, have some food while she went out on her hunting trip. The young woman put on, thanked her parents, put on her, the warm gear that her father had made, took a, a bag she had created to put in the, the food her mother had made, 
and smilingly took the ax, the ropes, and headed out to help feed her family. She actually enjoyed it once she got past the, the edges of the village. Being out in the vast array, it had snowed, so she knew she would have no difficulty finding rabbit tracks. And the, her brother, her older brother's clothes, which her father had so well adapted for her, kept her snug and warm. And it was a sunny day, so she felt very comfortable. It was a sunny day, but had she not been so excited about being on the hunt, she would have noticed that behind the bright sunny skies, a dark edging was there. And that usually signaled a snowstorm was coming. But this young woman was far too excited to be helping her parents, and especially, especially when she found what she had been looking for, rabbit tracks, and she became excited. She followed the group of tracks, and sure enough, she came down into a gully which was just teeming with rabbits. She was able to get five, 10, 12 of them, and more, and she put the rabbits, as she, as she hit them with the head of her ax, she carried them on the two strong ropes, dragging behind her, but she had a great number. And she was so excited, so excited in fact, in hunting these rabbits, she had not noticed that time had gone by more rapidly than she remembered and it was growing dark. More than that, snow had begun to fall again. And in so doing, it had covered her tracks, which she had counted on leading her back to the path that would have led her back easily to her village. Now, she was becoming a bit concerned because it was growing ever darker, ever quicker. And she had the, the rabbits, but she also did not know how to return to her home. So after giving it a couple of tries, going in the directions she thought would be best and realizing that, that she was lost, and would have to wait until the sun rose and she could recognize other landmarks to help her get home. She thought, I must find a way, perhaps under these rocks where I can stay for the night. I'll be fine, I have warm clothing. So she looked around and to her utter joy and amazement, she saw a cave. Oh, she was so relieved, but she was careful. This could be the lair of an animal. She had to be very careful. So she approached the mouth of the cave very carefully, gently laid down the rabbits, took her ax in one hand and peered inside. Instead of seeing just darkness as she had expected, in the far distance in the cave, she saw a light, a fire. Oh, she thought, can it be? Are there other hunters? Did they bank down the, under soot? The, 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 the coals that they had used for their fire. And she quietly and carefully, still not quite sure, came into the cave and there, to her utter joy and amazement, was a fire still, the embers still hot. Oh, she put down her, her ax, went out and brought in the rabbits, brought in the bag that had the corn cakes and began to make preparations for a safe and comfortable night. She began by taking off her coat placing it on the ground so she would have some place to sit and later sleep comfortably. She placed her rabbits against the wall. She took off her, her leggings and hung them near on the edge of a rock near the fire so that they could begin to dry. Then she removed from her bag the corn cakes that her mother had made, placed them near the fire to warm and selected one of her rabbits, prepared it for eating and began to roast it as well. Soon. The rabbit was cooked, the corn cakes were warm, and she ate the, the, the meat and had one of the corn cakes and felt completely comfortable and happy. She was even starting to get pleasantly sleepy and was just turning to, to rest and lay down on her, on her coat and cover herself with her other part, with her, with her other, pardon me, her remaining clothing, when she heard a strange sound in the distance a voice, and, and while she couldn't quite make out the words, it was saying, and that she knew meant, is there anyone there? I need help. So she moved to the front of the cave. Oh my gosh, she thought this is a, a fellow hunter in trouble. So she, after listening once more, she responded, with the phrase, la, fa, la, hi, 
meaning I am here. There was a pause in the other voice and she heard it grow stronger as it said, and as it grew closer to the cave, her excitement having encountered what she thought was a fellow hunter turned to sheer horror as she then heard the rattle, the rattle that was only used by the cannibal demons that she'd been warned about since childhood, many of whom inhabited the areas that were empty and bereft of people as this one was. <gasps> the young girl moved back because by now she knew the creature had, the demon had smelled her because <laughs> the rattle was getting louder and louder. And then her heart beating so she did not know what to do. She was trapped in the cave. She didn't know what to do then. To her horror, she saw lowering its face towards the edge of the cave, the face of the cannibal demon. It had yellow curling tusks, shaggy skinnish skin covered with hair, eyes that bulged from, from its face and a terrible set of talon-like hands. And it looked at her and it spoke to her and it said, you must let me in. And the young girl was so frightened she couldn't say anything. And then it said, fine, said the demon, if you will not invite me. I will come in myself. And he began to push his head and shoulders against the edge of the cave. The girl sat there, her heart beating, thinking she was going to die of fear. But to her amazement and, 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 ex, and excited and ex, in surprise, pleasant surprise, the demon creature, the cannibal demon could not get its broad shoulders in through the cave door. It's too small for it. <laughs> so, it began to see if it could not get it this way. Perhaps it could charm her. And it stood back and said, I, I am sorry that you misunderstood my intention. Hunger drove me to sound more, more aggressive than I am. Could you share with me something that you have to eat as I smell food in your cave? So the girl said, uh, I, have, I have corn cakes. And the demon, cannibal demon said, send them, throw them out to me. So the girl, one by one, threw the remaining corn cakes that her mother had prepared and the, the demon <coughs> gulped them each one with one gulp, no chewing, just <coughs> swallowed it in between its tusks and its foul mouth. <sighs> Said the demon, that is a good beginning, but I need more. I smell rabbits. Do you have rabbits in there? And the young one said, I do, but they are for my parents. Give them to me. I need them now. So one by one, the young girl threw the, the rabbits and, and each rabbit, as it, as it reached the demon, it gulped it down. Every bit of it, skin, not chewing, just gulped it down until she finally had no more rabbits. Then it said, is there nothing else? What about your boots? What about your coat? I smell they are made of deer skin. Throw those out to me, for I still hunger. And the young girl, not knowing what to do, removed everything, took the leggings down from where they were drying and threw them out, threw her coat, and each one, the greedy, ravenous demon, <coughs> swallowed them down. <sighs> now, have you anything else? And the girl said, no, no, I've given you everything, wearing simply her, her one dress beneath. And it said, then, I shall use my stone axe, and it held up a huge axe, to break the edge of this cave door. And then I shall have you as the final part of my meal. And with that, bung, 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 the cannibal demon began to bang and chip away at the edges of the cave, at the door and the entrance to the cave. And to her horror, the young girl saw the shale and the rock begin to fall, and she knew she knew it was just a matter of time before the cannibal demon reached her. And as it hang, hang, continued at its vicious work, the young girl could not stand it anymore and she fainted. Now, unknown to the young girl and unknown to the cannibal demon, two young gods were in, in an area not very far away from where they were. And they both sensed at the same time that a young lady was in danger, a young woman 
who had been caring enough about her elderly parents to want to, to risk going out in this type of weather and to do what usually only the young men of the village did, to hunt rabbits, to feed her parents. They knew all of this because they were gods. And then to their anger, they saw in their mind's eye also the cannibal demon that was breaking, making great progress in breaking its way towards her. They looked at each other and decided, we will help. And speedily, through their abilities and powers as gods, they found that they rushed to the entrance of the cave and the cannibal demon was so eagerly <laughs> getting through the door, he did not see when the two young gods, one taking each shoulder, <laughs> pulled him back away from the cave entrance and threw him to the ground. Wait, wait, what is this you do? And the two of them without a word took their great cudgels and beat the cannibal demon to death. And then they, they peeked in to see if the young girl was all right and saw she had fainted. So while she was in a faint, they <laughs> cut open the huge belly of the cannibal demon, which had grown incredibly large from his very greedy meal and removed from it, first tossing out into the snow all of the rabbits, but then taking out the young girl's warm clothing, her outer clothing, her leggings, and through their powers, turning them fresh again, clean as though they had never been inside of the demon. Then once the clothes were dry, they transformed themselves to look like two handsome young men because they knew their, their visages as gods might frighten her. They quietly entered the cave, carrying with them the young woman's freshly, freshly laundered, basically, uh, God laundered clothing. And they whispered to her, young woman, young woman, please wake up. And the girl coming out of her faint was startled to see these young men. And they said, no, 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 do not be afraid. We heard that you needed help. We are fellow hunters. We have killed the demon and we have thrown his body into the river. So you need not be afraid. And, and we have brought you your clothing. And the young girl, she was relaxing, seeing how handsome and kind these young men were, but she had been covering herself because she was only in her underdress. They said, we will step out while you put your clothing on. Then we will come back in and see what else we can do to help you. Oh, the young, the young huntress was so relieved. She put on all of her clothing and she gathered her things into a bag and she called the young men or gods, which she did not know, of course, back in. She said, oh, thank you. I cannot thank you enough for saving my life for I don't know how getting my clothing so dry. And if you know the way back to my village, and they said, yes, we do. If you could help me get there, I would be so grateful. Although I'm disappointed that demon ate all of my rabbits and I have no food to bring back to my parents. And I am so sad at that. And the two young gods said, do not fear. As we lead you back, we are great hunters. We will find you even more rabbits and we will carry them to your village for you so that you need not drag them all that heavy way. And the young woman said, you can do this? They said, oh, believe us, we can. And sure enough, in keeping with their word, as they traveled the route that the young gods took them, there were rabbits to be found on all sides and they captured enough of them, caught enough of them, strung them onto the two ropes so that as they came finally to where they could see the smoke coming from the homes in her village, they said to her, now you can take it from here, but you, you know this, we know in our hearts, you are a good daughter remain so. And the young woman thanked them and thanked them and headed into the village. As she entered, it was day, daylight, and many of the villagers were astounded to see her, a young woman, carrying more rabbits than any of the young men had brought in. And her parents, hearing the commotion in the village as they heard her approach, <gasps> to their relief and joy, they came out and saw their beloved daughter and they said, oh, we were so worried when you didn't come home last night, we thought we had lost you. And she said, no, no, my parents, not only have you not lost me, look at what I have for you. <gasps> and they were so, the whole family so happy. And the village was indeed amazed. And many of the young men who had been less than kind were rather grumpy that she had outshone them. So from that day onward, the young woman was accepted as a huntress. And she fed her family and herself, kept her parents warm 
and dry and happy. And they and she lived that way for the rest of their lives. And that is the Zuni tale of the rabbit huntress. Um, before I bring up some points that I'm hoping some of you might add, um, again, if there are any questions, um, please let me know. Questions, comments, great thoughts, lesser thoughts. I'm eager to have them all. Um, I'll pause for a minute, and then I want to throw something out to kind of, I'm, I'm hoping might, boom, boom, you know, get things a little bit, um, I don't know, uh, set a fire underneath uh, your imaginations a little bit, which I hope the stories are doing. Um, why don't I tell this? And then if anything comes, uh, my friends will read to me any comments or questions. Okay, so as Lorna said at the beginning, I am a multicultural storyteller. Uh, of course, being Afro-Indigenous, my African-American and Native American heritage stories are of particular and keen interest to me, but I love stories from everywhere. And I don't know, of course, the ethnic backgrounds of all of you that are listening to me now, but I'm assuming that we have a nice mixture of different types and, and sorts. And, and so I would like to just um, provide a little bit of the background of where I got storytelling how it became a part of my life, multiculturally, as well as with my own heritage. And I'd like to see if any of you might be willing to just share how you came into first hear stories in your family or culture. Maybe it was at a family gathering. Maybe it was at a, a, a place of worship. Maybe it was a social setting. Maybe you read it in books about your library books. A lot of mine first began with library books, of course, as I'm sure almost all of you, or family books, um, a little thought. So as an internationalist, I tell stories, uh, uh, multicultural stories from around the world. And I usually try to tell them in pretty much the same accent or voice as the, um, as the land from which they came. So if I'm telling you a story from England, and many of those were based, I first learned on the troubadours, the ones who would, who would go from town to town playing their instruments and letting everyone know the lands and the stories. I learned many of those because growing up, there was a great focus, which was fine, but, but unfortunately more limited on only English and European stories. And excellent as they were, they weren't the kind, they didn't have a, the, the variety we're, I'm pleased to say we're getting now, but they were wonderful tales. Um, among them is, of course, we learned one of the greatest storytellers from British history, Geoffrey Chaucer and the Canterbury Tales. Or I learned also from, from one friend of the family who was French, I learned uh, many of the things from French literature. I was particularly intrigued when she told us her name was Madame Corcoran. And she told the most marvelous story when I was 13 about an enchanted French cat that could turn itself and turn thread into a long, long thread that would then in turn be spun into a large tapestry that carried with it great magical powers. So listening to Madame Cochran, she told us also that there were many chanson songs that would often tell the stories from France. And many of the friends I grew up with because my father was an artist designer. My mother was a sociologist. So many of us, our friends were from different cultures. And I learned from my friends from Eastern Europe, many of my favorite ghost stories, tales of the vampire and the werewolf and the great clay golem who would rise from the earth to do its master's bidding. So Eastern Europe tradition for me introduced me to my love of the ghost story. And I, of course, am not alone because as I'm sure you all know, such stories influenced a young Irish writer by the name of Bram Stoker, who wrote what is arguably one of the most famous of the ghost stories or of the tales from this, based on this part of the world, based on a story called The Vampire, which he turned into Dracula. And a young woman who was equally impressed by these sources by the name of Mary Shelley, created Frankenstein or the new Prometheus from based it. So I've learned a great deal there. But 
even though I was born and reared on the south side of Chicago, I went to visit the American South quite a bit with my aunt, to visit my aunt. And um, my aunt and cousins, uh, she was widow. So she had a gentleman by the name of Mr. Brown that helped her around the house, excuse me, around the yard. When I visit my aunt family down in the south, I loved hearing the stories because that's where my African-American heritage really came to life. I would go and there would be people sitting on their porches down the street from my aunt Thelma's house. They always welcomed the children. They were always in a rocking chair, an older gentleman or an older lady. And she is, she would, they would almost always have a pipe and they would start quietly telling stories in that same even voice that I used to hear from like the gentleman that I told you, the Native American storyteller from New York. And I learned tales about witch women and men. I learned tales about the people who could fly. There's a famous book about that. All kinds relating to my African-American heritage. But the most frightening to me were from the gentleman who helped my aunt, Mr. Brown, because he told true stories that had happened to him. He too was African-American. And right down the street from my aunt's home, there was the at Mount Pisgah African-American Methodist Church. And he swore that in summer nights, there would be two dogs, black dogs with bright red eyes that would slink around the edge of the church, not coming too close to it because it was sacred ground. And to see them, he had seen them once, he said, chilled your blood. So I would get all of that in that way. But my native heritage, the stories I got there from, from my, primarily my own family. My mother was, it was my mother's side, not my dad's side, that had my Native American, from which my Native American heritage comes. In fact, the first trip of my, my six month old life was sadly to the Akmogli Reservation, which is where my branch of the Muscogee Creek, our family's from, to my grandfather, my mother's father's funeral. Um, I was six months old. And mama took me down with her, but she and dad felt my older sister was only five and then it might be too much. And plus papa had to work. So mama and I went down and I was on the res. My grandfather is buried on the res. And, um, but before his passing, my uncles, my mother's elder, older brother, my uncle Bill told us many of the strange stories that related to our native American heritage. One of which involved his having seen himself when my, my, his mother, my grandmother, and his father, my grandfather, were visiting one of the older cemeteries that contained several of their relatives, uh, also of Native heritage. And Uncle Bill swore that the gate to the cemetery, as they approached, would swing open of its own accord. No wind, nothing electronic making it. And after they left, it would swing closed. We learned many stories like this, not all supernatural, but the tales of our, our background, our people. My mother was in the Indian boarding schools and we learned tales that taught me about native culture that weren't always as happy, but we learned many, many things. So I felt steeped in it. So I wanna just ask, and we can wait until after the third story if you'd like, I hope, or pause for a minute now. Is there anyone who'd be willing to share what you, how your, how you came to, to know about stories in your life, library books, family members. I would be keenly interested and I'll just, just give it a moment, then we can launch into story three, but would anyone be willing to share anything like that? Joyce, we have several comments that I wanna share with you. So one is, I find any time you can get a, a child's attention is wonderful and storytelling is becoming a very lost art. So that was from last time. And they came a, a bit later. But here are some of the things. A good story, Wado. Enjoying this. And then here's some other things. Um, one, um, Penny shares, my grandpa told me stories, mostly fictional, aka fibs, but he was very captivating. I love and, that. Yes. And then Susan shared, your voice of the stories is compelling. Thank you. Thank you. Thank and you. then Jen shared, my grandmother would tell us our stories in Spanish before bed. Oh, I love this. I love, thank you, first of all, all of you for sharing. And for those who didn't feel to share, I, you're, you're interested. It's very much appreciated. 
But I want to say, this is where I, I revel in knowing that people's grandparents and, and that they heard these tales and, I'm, and it, how much it becomes a part of our lives. And as, as one person pointed out, children, this is how we pass on interest, a passion in the world around them, ideas, imagination. And I'm so glad you're enjoying the stories because I, as you probably picked up because I kind of wear all that on my face. I'm loving doing this. I love telling stories. <laughs> uh, so um, if there yeah. are no at the moment, oh, is there more? Sure. Yes, there is. I oh, believe good. I was born a storyteller. That comes from Linda, which is cool. And I know from my own background, we have always shared stories. Like, I feel like all my family told stories their whole life um, oh. and shared those and grew up. So we heard stories of when the family was younger and had stories, you know, of our heritage and our background too. And so, you know, those things, I think for many of us are very important parts of our childhood. Um, yes. May also um, shared, we had no electricity. So we sat on the old porch in the dark and told and listened. Oh my God, I love this. That is, it's a, the atmosphere that we're, I'm hearing all of you that are, that we all know that storytelling can create. It creates a whole world within our world. And, and even though, even when circumstances are such, you might say, well, you know, my mother used to talk about using uh, oil lamps because in parts when she was growing up in the depression, they didn't always have electricity. But mama said that grandma would light those lamps and then they would talk and run. I mean, it, it added a glow that created an atmosphere. And so I really appreciate what everyone is saying. And like I said, as a kid, sitting cross-legged in front of those porches where those older folks would be rocking and telling us these stories and smoking their pipes. Oh my gosh, these are the memories that that kind of help. And as, and as educators, as parents, and just, people we can we can share this because storytelling oh storytelling does not have to be professionally trained it's sharing which 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 we're doing now sharing stories with each other Ooh. and then penny also commented linda is most assuredly a storyteller I, I i i have had some of her books and this is very fun thank you so much and then linda responded yes so Everyone feels free. You can just share in the chat directly to the hosts and panels, or you can share with everyone. So mm -hmm. feel free to do that. These are great that everyone is sharing. Mm -hmm. Oh, and I'd love to hear Linda this as a storyteller. I enjoy listening to my fellow storytellers every bit as much as I enjoy, uh, you know, telling them. And I have to say one other thing before I go on to story three. The, I Maybe I'm being naive, but I have never seen the competition with storytellers that I see in other things. You know, I mean, I'm a writer, a published writer. And so sometimes, of course, there's a lot of competition. Everybody has that. But with storytellers, I usually see a great deal of interest and support in each other. You know, and, and it's as though there's enough great tales in the world to go around for everybody. <laughs> so uh, it's nice to hear all this and to hear people opening and sharing. And I'm, like I said, I'm enjoying sharing these ancient tales with you all tonight. Well, I'll proceed to story three. And if anybody has any ideas or anything they want to add between the next, this one and the next, my pleasure to hear. So this one is the exact name is How the Crow Came to be Black. And it is from the uh, Brule Sioux people of South Dakota. So, in the days long past, all crows were white. It was just the, the way nature had made them. And the people of the uh, Brule Sioux were excellent hunters. And, but this was in a time that this story takes place when the crows were all white, that the there, the weapons were only um, stone wrapped spears with the edges made into, into sharp enough to be hunted as hunters. And agriculture was not such that they could grow as much as they needed. They usually foraged for wild fruits and vegetables. So what the uh, Brule Sioux people relied upon was buffalo meat, the buffalo and buffalo skins to line their homes and to make into clothing and to make into bed coverings. So they were relied entirely in their lives, literally depended on the buffalo herds. Well, 
The good news was there were many, many buffalo that roamed near their villages and, and this was great. The bad news was for the, for the people, the Brule Sioux people and the hunters, the crows and the buffalo were good friends. So what would happen when a hunting party of, of Brule Sioux men would come and be quietly easing up with their spears, their stone tipped spears to get the buffalo the crows would come flapping down <laughs> and perch right on the buffalo's shoulders in between their um their shoulder blades in between their shoulders and say, ah, huh, my, my cousin, the hunters are coming. <laughs> They're in the valley below. You'll want to move and move quickly. <laughs> and they would fly off and the buffalo would stampede away. Whew, this has gotten, they had gotten to the point where because the crows were constantly warning the buffalo. The hunters were getting fewer and fewer uh, buffalo that they needed to feed the, the, their village. The only ones they could get would be the some that would could not move fast enough or were near the end of the of the herd. That wasn't enough to feed all the people. They faced starvation. So, a great council meeting was called in the village, and everyone began to discuss what could be done to help stop the crows basically from, from warning their friends, the buffalo. So after much talk and concern and, and chatter, one of the older chiefs stood up and he said, ah, I have seen something. I know you may have all seen with me that one crow, one of the white crows is larger than all the others. It's huge. It must be their leader. And the, the Men in the council nodded and they said, it occurs to me that if we could capture that leader and teach him to be under our will, perhaps he could influence the others out of fear to stop warning the buffalo. It's worth a try. And the whole group agreed that it was indeed. So once the older chief had gotten the okay, he went back to his home and returned with a buffalo robe that still had the head and the horns attached. He then looked about him and called one of the youngest, strongest of the hunters and said, come here, young man. And the young man did. And he said, I want you to lie down on the floor. And after he had done that, the old chief adjusted the head and horns and the buffalo robe onto him. And he said, now stand up. And he they hooked it to his clothing so that it remained attached to him. They used small pointed bones to do that like pins. He said, now, what I want you to do is to go out and mingle with the buffalo herd. Walk on all fours. You can, and take this rope, which he gave him and, and put into a part underneath the robe. He said, when the great large white crow comes, capture him, tie this around his feet and bring him back to the council. We will deal with him then. And we will make sure that we can get food for our people by stopping the crows from always telling the buffalo we are here. So the young man agreed and all patted him on the back as he headed out with the robe over him and the head and the horns. And he headed out quietly to where the large buffalo herd was grazing, easing carefully up over the rise as he saw them. He quietly joined them. None of them noticed. And he began to pretend as if he too were eating the grass and grazing. Then, as was, a, another, as was in keeping with the old, general, the old chief's plan, the other members of the tribe, the hunters, began to ease up as they always did from the valley below. And sure enough, just as they were coming to, close to the rise on the hill where they could have come over and captured many of the buffalo, the crows came flapping down warning, ah, my cousin, they are coming, ah, you must go, and they flew off. So all the buffalo began to, to, to stampede away, except for the young man who appeared to have not heard and continued, to continued to seem as if he were grazing. Well, after a few moments, the largest, the great crow, the one they were seeking, saw this, and he flew back, flew back and said, ah, my brother, did you not hear? You must go, go. The hunters are almost here. And again, 
The young warrior pretended mm, to only be grazing till the crow, the great crow moved closer and said, are you not able to hear me? <laughs> you are in danger. And, and no sooner had that word gotten out of his, out of the crow's mouth than the young man reached up, grabbed it by the legs and the crow could not get away, held it with one hand and wrapped the cord tightly <sighs> around it <laughs> and kept the crow. <laughs> until the crow realized there was no point in fighting. And the young man threw him over his back, stood up, joined the other hunters, and they brought the live crow, the great white live crow, back with them to the council chamber. Well, the crow could speak in their language. And he, he said, what do you want of me? Why am I here? As he was thrown with none too good grace into the center of the area where the council was taking place. And near, near him was the council fire, blazing to keep everyone warm. So the, um, the crow looked very frightened and all of the, um, the old chief and the, all of the warriors and the hunters said, we have come to figure a way for you to stop, stop from warning the buffalo and stop it from stopping us from getting our food supply. That is why we are here. And the crow said, I, I don't know what to tell you. And then one of the more hot-headed young hunters said, well, then if you don't know what to tell us, here's what you deserve for having put us through this. And before anyone could stop him, this hothead grabbed the white crow, threw him into the fire and watched the blaze rush up. <gasps> All of them were shocked, but the blaze immediately burned off the ropes that were tying the, the, the great white crow's feet. But then the great white crow then, ah, ah, he flew up out of the flame, but he had been singed all over by the fire. He had been in it long enough that it didn't kill him, but he had turned his feathers completely black. And he hovered for a minute in pain and fear and said, fine, very well, you hunters win. I will tell all of my kind, all of the crows to stop warning the buffalo. Just please, please don't try to capture any more of us. And with that, <laughs> The great white crow, who was now the great black crow, flew off into the distance. And from that day onward, none of the crows warned the buffalo anymore about hunters. And as the time went on, interestingly enough, the new crows that, that came were no longer white, they were black. And as we see today, all the crows are the same color, black. So that is the tale of why we have the crows black. And I'm wondering if anybody had any um, images or ideas about the stories that strike you uh, that you'd like to share. You know, what does anything stick out or anything, you know, that, that you feel was a lesson that we were all meant to learn that, that particularly came out or any thoughts at all? Let me just give a few minutes before we launch into, launch into our last story. Joyce, we did have one person who shared a, a comment midway through the story. She said, I make up stories so children and adults can remember the folds of origami paper folding. That's brilliant. That is absolutely brilliant. Um, my dad introduced me to origami as a child and it was one of my hobbies. I loved it. And stories could, that's so smart because stories would not only be a way to help the children learn the intricate folding, give them the, the, the interest to keep going to that, it would entertain them while they were doing it and keep them, make them stick to task. Oh, see, the storyteller in us all has so many valuable and wonderful um, um, facets. So I love that. And again, I thank you all. See, I'll remember these as I go on and do other storytellings because that's the other thing I love. Storytellers like you folks are doing, we all share, we all share. We like to hear what others have done, add ideas, add our own. Oh, it's lovely. So thank you for that. Thank all of you. Oh my gosh. Uh, and another one, Gina yes. just shared, I make up stories to teach my students to remember math algorithms. You're kidding. Okay, all right. Um, this is a Joyce Miller Bean coming clean moment. I'm terribly weak at mathematics. I would love to know how storytelling could help me understand algorithms better. 
my kids get them. I don't. Oh my gosh, that is that is equally brilliant. And it also, I imagine, keeps your students engaged and helps them, works as a mnemonic device to help them remember. Oh, again, oh my goodness, that's fantastic. <laughs> Linda also oh. shared, your stories make me think about why the snake's belly is white. Ooh, I've never heard a story about that. And I'll bet there is one. Now you've got me intrigued. I'm gonna to have to look that up. My, my uh, branch of the Muscogee Creek, the great corn snake is one of our, our great symbols. We do a stomp dance, which represents us regarding that snake, bringing it out. So Aisha, that's a very good and intriguing question. Why do they have white bellies? Hmm. There's bound to be a great tale relating to that. You know, why was Moby Dick white, the great whale? Hmm? Hmm? No, seriously, I love this. Well, I'm sort of serious about that too. <laughs> oh, anything else before we go on to story number four? Um, Linda said also, look for a water spot, a spider story um, by ah, Cherokee. I oh, will. I Cherokee, I'm sorry, go ahead. Cherokee Nation, go ahead. Mm -hmm. A what? Yeah, thank you. Water spider story. I will look that up. I will look up the white belly of the snake. I love this stuff. Oh, well, I will launch into the final story for tonight, which is the man who was afraid of nothing. And it comes to us also from the Brule Sioux people. So one fine day, four ghosts were sitting around talking, smoking ghost smoke, sharing whatever it is ghosts do to pass the time. And in the course of their conversation, one of the ghosts said, say, I've heard about some man over in the near village who says, get this, he is not afraid of anything. And the first ghost said, oh, really? Well, huh, huh, let me get in touch with him. I'll teach him a thing or two about being afraid. And the second ghost said, ha, I could beat you any night of the evening. I won't say day of the week because we don't focus on days. Ah, uh, I could be even more scary. And then the fourth ghost said, wait, 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 we're looking at this all wrong. Why don't we make a wager between us that whichever of the four, whoever of the four of us most scares this arrogant man will win ah, the ghost horse of all the others because each of the ghosts had his own ghost horse. So they all agreed. Well, it so happened that the young man who had claimed he was afraid of nothing was walking home at that very moment from a neighboring village. It was a crisp, brightly moonlit night and he was all alone on the road. So, but he didn't have any concerns about that. He didn't even seem concerned when out of nowhere up rose a skeleton, the first ghost who had made himself appear as a skeleton to frighten the young man. And he came at him and said, ha! So, are you the one that I hear says he's afraid of nothing? How do you feel now looking at me? And the young man said, I feel that I need for you to get out of my way. And the ghost was taken aback. He said, no, no, I am here. I have more power than you. And we will now play a game of stick and roll. And if, if you do not do as I say, then you will see my, my wrath. And so the young man put down what he was carrying and said, stick and roll, eh? Hoop and roll is how we call it. Well, then let's play it. And he reached out and to the, before the ghost slash skeleton, skeleton could do anything, the young man grabbed off two of his bones, shaped them into a hoop and pulled another one and began rolling the hoop down the road as children in the villages did. And the skeleton was like, wait, wait, this wasn't what I had in mind. He said, oh, really? Well, perhaps this is. And coming back to the man, the young, to the ghost, the man reached up, pulled off the, the ghost's skull and began boom, 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 hitting it systematically. Perhaps boom, 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 boom. You'd like a little drum music. And the ghost was like, no, oh, oh no, oh, you're giving me a headache. And the young man said, you can't have a headache. You're a ghost, but be gone with you. Ah, and with that, <laughs> the first ghost went limping off until he disappeared into the darkness of the forest. <sighs> the young man brushed his hands off and picked up his bag and started, continued on his journey back to his own village. Well, before he had gone more than a few paces, 
up jumped ghost number two. And he too appeared in a skeleton form. So he stood before the man with his hands on his skeletal hips and said, ha, you may have frightened that first ghost, but he's weak, but you won't get past me so easily. I intend to make you play a game of shinny ball. And if you lose, I will tear you to pieces. And if I win, I get you anyway. So what say you? And if you win, which will not happen, you get to continue without my interference. Shall we play? And the young man calmly looked at this ghost, put down his bag and said, why not? And as the ghost was coming towards him, much to his horror, the young man grabbed both of his shoulders and uh, snapped them apart the way you would separate a chicken or a turkey if you were cooking. And the ghost says, what, what? He said, you said you wanted to play shinny ball. We shall need these. And he threw one of them down, then reached over and as he had done with the other, uh, uh, boop, pulled the skull of the ghost off uh, and it could still talk. Wait, what are you doing? He said, oh, shinny ball needs someone to hit. And he threw it up and whacked it across the road. Uh, screamed the ghost, stop it. And he said, no, 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 that was just one. The young man trotted over, picked the skull up and the, and the ghost said, no, no, stop it. Oh no, you invited me to play, let's play. He threw it up again, whack. And by the time he had done it three times, the ghost said, oh no, enough, enough, leave me be. And he pulled together his ghostly skeletal self and scooted off to the other side of the road for the second side of the forest. Well, the young man picked up his bundle and thought, I hope that's it for tonight. But ah, uh, no. <laughs> Ghost number three appeared also as a skeleton. <laughs> and this one stood in front of him and said, I don't think you're ready to deal with me. You, I'm not the same as those two who went before me. The young man put down his bag and said, no, I can tell that. You've got a weak chest. He goes, what? And reaching forward, the young man... <laughs> ripped the ghost's rib cage out of its chest. And the ghost went, wait, what, what are you doing? And the other man looked around and he said, I think, I think I'm going to go sledding. There's snow at the top of that mountain peak, watch me. And he scurried up to the top of the hill, it was really a hill, not a mountain. And the ghost was screaming, what, what are you doing? And this young man uh, bent open the rib cage enough to settle himself in and then ha ha, began sliding down the hill using the ghost's ribs as a sled. And the ghost is like, stop it, stop it. That, I can feel the pain. And the, and the young man said, you can't feel any pain. You're a ghost. So the ghost said, please, please, I'll leave you alone. Give it back to me. And the young man said, oh, of course I will. But you know, it's gotten kind of dirty. And so saying, he threw it into the pond over at the side. <gasps> and the ghost said, I need that. I can't, I can't be separated from myself. And the young man said, well, why don't you go over and go into the water and fetch it? In fact, it would clean you up. And that would make you a woman happy when you get home. He said, I am a woman. And the man said, well, forgive me, but you know, with ghosts, it's hard to tell. And so off then went the woman ghost and jumped in to get her rib cage. And the young man watched her, <laughs> chuckled to himself and carried his bag with him and was saying, finally, finally, it's done. And then the fourth ghost appeared. This one was on his ghostly horse and he glared down at the man. He was the biggest and indeed the toughest of the four ghosts. And he said, while holding the bridle of his ghostly skeletal horse, you have not met my like. You think these others are tough? You think they're brave and fearless? You think you're brave and fearless? Ha, watch me deal with you. I." Do not intend to play any games. I intend to kill you. And the young man blinked, put down his bag and said, but I am a ghost too. And the ghost, what are, you, what are you talking about? The man began to distort his face. You think I'm fearless because I am human? I can rip you to pieces. And he headed towards it. And the ghost of the horse, no, no, no. There's no need for that. But the young man leaped forward. He was very strong as well as unafraid. Pulled the, the ghost off of the horse and had the horse, held the horse with his bridle and began to stomp the skeletal ghost until it broke into multiple pieces, screaming at each stomp, stop, just let me go. And the young man said, fine, you may go, but I keep your horse. Oh, take her, take her. 
and he slunk off towards the back part of the road. Well, the young man grabbed up his bundle, leaped onto the back of the skeletal horse, which surprised him, it held him, and he began to ride in comfort the remaining amount of time it took to get to his village. It was just coming on sunrise when he reached the village. No one was mainly up, but a few of the women had gotten up early to fetch water from the local, from the village well for their families. And to their horror, they saw the young man whom they recognized riding this ghost skeletal horse. They screamed and dropped their water containers and water vessels and ran back to their homes and their shrieks and screams woke up the rest of the village. And everyone said, what, what is it? Oh, coming out of their doors, looking out of their uh, window areas. And oh, they were stunned to see him riding along on this ghostly horse. And as the sun rose even higher, the young man slipped off of the horse because it began to fade. And by the time the sun was fully up, the horse had disappeared. And the young man was smiling smugly and cockily as he threw his bag over his shoulder and said, I'm back. Well, the villagers were just in awe of his courage as he told them about the encounters with the four ghosts and how he had handled them. And they obviously believed him because he had ridden in on a ghost horse. And they said, whoa, we have never seen this kind of courage. You are truly the bravest. And the young man said, well, yes, yes, I am. And then some of the other men said, Sir, sit down, rest a bit. We want to hear more of the details. So the young man sat down with his back against a tree as the whole members of the village, men, women, children, all gathered around in great interest. And as he was telling and bragging about how brave he had been, unknown to him, a little spider had climbed down off of the tree and was on his shoulder and heading down. When the young man paused in his story <gasps> and looked over and saw the spider, he jumped up and said, oh, oh, get it off of me, someone, oh, oh, get it off of me. And he was dancing around to the shock and amazement of everyone. And finally, a little girl came out smiling, stood on tiptoe, reached up, pulled the spider off of his shoulder oh, oh, and gently let it go into the, into the sand and across the road as the rest of the village looked at the young man with disdain. And he, having made perhaps learned a lesson or two about humility, just could not meet any of their eyes. And that is my last story for the evening, The Man Who Was Afraid of Nothing. Um, I hope you've enjoyed the stories. And if there are any, we have, uh, by my reckoning, we've got about five minutes, Lorna, I think we have about five minutes remaining, am I correct? You are. We can go a little bit longer if we need to. If there's, those are all my stories, but if anybody wants to share or discuss or add, I would love, I'm entirely happy to remain at your disposal. Um, anyone have anything they'd like to share? So feel free to put that in the chat or um, to put, if you had a question, you can put that in the chat too. So I'd love These, it. These were wonderful stories, Joy. Thank you so Thank much. You. Oh. And you do such a wonderful job at telling them and making us feel as though we're part of it. So thank oh. you. That you're welcome to thank you, Lorna, and everyone else. You guys are wonderful. Great audience. <laughs> and you also are, are getting a couple of the compliments here oh. in the chat too. Um, Joyce Bean, you are a wonderful storyteller. That comes from May. So. Thank you. Thank you. If I could blush, I would, but it doesn't work for me. <laughs> and then um, Heather says, Himayu, I believe is how you say it, which means thank you, Joyce. Yes, thank and, you. Oh, welcome, Heather. <laughs> and then Jen says, Joyce, this was amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jen. Thank you all. I love it. I'm glad you've all enjoyed it, right? I just, it's been an honor and a pleasure. So you also have from Bridget, fabulous. Linda said, thank you, Wado. I love the different stories you have told. Um, Penny says, thank you for fireside chat. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you all. <laughs> and then Mallory said, love hearing your stories. You, you're making my evening. I am so happy. As, as many of you are also have said how your storytellers were all informal storytellers as well. It makes as much to me as I'm glad you're enjoying it. It gives me that enjoyment from hearing that. That just really makes me happy. Thank you all.
And it's always great to spend time in an evening in the colds of winter, gathered together in groups um, mm -hmm. to hear stories and share stories. Yes, um, great so memories. I just thank you so much for everything and for this tonight. Um, it seems our chat has slowed down just a little bit. I know what I'm hearing from everybody is that they really enjoyed it. So thank you. Have a wonderful holiday season and stay warm as we move into this cold season. And thank you once again for joining us. And thank you, Joyce, so much for sharing your stories. My pleasure, Lorna. Good night, everyone. Good night.